Ladies and Metalfish, this is your hard-boiled King of Draw style Daddy Jonjo, baby. So, Guild Format has a bit of a weird dichotomy. Either people love it for its classic style gameplay and card pool, or people criticize it for its ban list allowing certain powerful cards to remain in the game. And who can blame them when looking at the April 2005 TCG list? Compared to the October 2004 list, a lot of previously forbidden cards were laxed. Sangan, Delinquent Duo, Graceful Charity, and Mirror Force, just to name a few. On the flip side, many cards were forbidden, which duelists should be thankful for, such as Fiber Jar, Magical Scientist, Painful Choice, and Mirage of Nightmare, among others. Honestly, in many ways, the previous Warrior format is like a strange alternate reality of GOAT format. And seeing as one metagame is clearly more popular than the other, the stats show duels prefer a game with Delinquent Duo over Mirage of Nightmare. Okay, so we've established that the April 2005 list was an improvement over the October 2004 list. So why do people still dislike said list? And this channel is a one-man band, and all of your support helps, so consider becoming a Janjo patron for as little as $2 a month and be the reason this small Yu-Gi-Oh! history channel becomes the best Yu-Gi-Oh! channel out there. As previously stated, many power cards in GOAT format are staples in most decks. Duo can rip two cards from your hand with little cost from the opponent. Pot of Greed and Graceful Charity are incredibly strong draw cards. Mirror Forest can simply wipe your field should you decide to go aggressive once. And you could have an argument for either side of the fence for every card on the list. United We Stand should have saved Ben. Bring back Change of Heart, take Lightning Vortex off the list entirely. But there is something to be said about people's complaints, and for the most part, they're valid. Sometimes, yeah, getting two cards ripped out of your hand is annoying if not making yourself empowered when you're the one activating the spell card. Sometimes using duo on a skilled opponent may not matter since they have the skills to play through a single card. Sometimes it may give you the leverage to win in an otherwise unwinnable game state. A powerful card that takes little to no skill to use. Interesting. With that in mind, just because it can work in your favor as much as it doesn't, does that mean it's a balanced card? Short answer is no, simply due to people being able to play with the tools given. Just because Pot of Greed can be used in every deck doesn't mean it's any less powerful for its intended purpose. Of course, power creep is a factor in the long game, but that's a discussion for another day. It's hard to compare this to Warrior Format in that regard, since that format banned Duo in favor of its treasured brothers, Confiscation and Forceful Sentry. But one can't deny the popularity of GOAT Format, and the list allows for many decks, yes even casual ones, to play strong cards. The card pool wasn't terribly big by this point, so allowing access to generic good stuff like Charity gives decks more speed and options in an era where the game was considerably slow. And for someone who loves his jank, I can appreciate this aspect. I've even had an entire stream dedicated to what if GOAT format updated its ban list. For the record, I do not condone any actual changes, as that would change what the format is and ruin its historical element. But it was an interesting exercise to take a look at the pre-existing list and understand what the problems, non-problems, and heart of the format are. Cards that can win games out of nowhere like BLS and Ring should probably get hit. Cards like Marauding Captain and Abyss Soldier arguably would not have a problem being taken off the list entirely. At the same time, cards like Tsukiyomi and Scapegoat are in many ways the lifeblood of GOAT and what makes the format unique unto itself, so I wouldn't want to hit those. Of course, this is all speculation on my end. However, the game of Yu-Gi-Oh did not stop there. So what happened to the format after GOAT? Now we move on to the next list in October 2005. What did Upper Deck say about the previous meta in the Autumn period? After all, if anyone can look at GOAT and call out its issues, it's the company that drove the TCG at the time. Lists tend to have a variety of reasonings to their madness, whether it's to fix or shake up the competitive scene, pushing a product, or preemptively stopping a future degenerate play. In the case of the October 2005 list, new additions to the card pool included 
Cybernetic Revolution, Elemental Energy, and Shadow of Infinity. There were plenty of strong cards here from Cyber Dragon to Pot of Avarice to Treeborn Frog. That said, no newly released cards aside from one Shonen Jump promo were added to the list. Point being, this list is a solid reflection of the meta climate moving forward. No longer restricted are Chick the Yellow, Marauding Captain, and Vampire Lord. I don't think anyone had any issues with these monsters beforehand. Newly Limited, Book of Moon and Tayu, Confiscation, Dark Hole, Exchange of the Spirits, Limiter Removal, Faith, Meta, Night Assailant, Knock, Scapegoat, Restrict, and Sook. For the most part, this was a clear hit to the top deck, Go Control. The Sook lock was real, and Upper Deck knew the deck wouldn't remain in the same form it took at previous SJCs. Dark Hole and Confiscation were brought back in lieu of all the cards the list dragged down with it. Forbidden were BLS, Duo, Charity, Mirror Force, Pot Agreed, Ring, Serpent, and Tribe. Once again, this was a major hit to Goat Control. This was also a larger hit to power cards in general, as in modern Goat play we see these cards in almost every meta viable deck. The issues I stated in my Janjo livestream were present here. Cards with blowout capabilities was the name of the game, and it's hard to argue against it. The forbidden cards are all things people have complained about. And it's not like Yu-Gi-Oh stopped the card pool here, as again, we now have a plethora of new, strong cards. Like, yeah, instead of BLS, we have Cyber Twin Dragon. Instead of Serpent, we have Treeborn Frog. But it was evident that the cards that were already in the circuit were more than viable in orbiting formats. Is this to say blowout cards were the only issue? Even though my own updated list was similar, I still felt like Cyber Jar, which is another blowout card, should have been hit. But cards that are strong in a retrospective sense, like Gravekeeper Spy and Trap Dust Shoot, are problems that should be addressed in this scenario too. Which brings up the point of historical play, not showcasing every possible strong card for a variety of reasons. So who's to say Upper Deck would have hit Dust Shoot, a card that otherwise wouldn't get hit in any way until the September 2007 list? Solemn Judgment is another card that Duelist didn't have the same mindset towards comparatively. Same goes for the emergence of top tier burn decks, or time given between the release of Flaming Eternity with Sacred Phoenix and Goat Format, compared to the period in hindsight. So no, the October 2005 list doesn't explain the game in a modern sense, but that's a given. It brought up the issues with a contemporary meta and clear as day power cards within a reasonable number of additions to the list without downright getting rid of what everyone was playing. Of course, it had to have some sort of agenda, but said agenda was not beyond logic. Any retro format is bound to have changes and meta calls different to what was played at the time. Edison, which was famous for its deck variety, will eventually narrow down to a finite amount of decks like Blackwing or Hero Beat. That's just the nature of competitive play. Before we get too off topic, let's realign. With my talking points on the field, what is actually the issue with the Go format ban list? According to Upper Deck, the two primary issues were Go Control, in which it was the most commonly topping deck of its time, and even still, a majority of the deck's engine was limited and not outright banned. Secondly, the blowout cards that gave powerful advantages that could fit in just about any deck was seen as the largest fault. In a modern sense, sure, you could say a card like Dust Shoot is a big problem, but most people would agree with Upper Deck's take on the matter, at least in regards to blowout cards. If you cut every strong piece, then the game would be dull, and I agree given my own list. Blowout cards and a single top deck are not healthy for a game. To be fair, in modern times, even when Chaos Turbo is the best deck, other tournament winning decks are around every corner with new strategies coming out of the woodwork once in a blue moon. While the problematic cards do exist, duelists play around them because the format has remained enjoyable for everything it offers. There's a reason Reaper format didn't eclipse GOAT and it wasn't just Cyberstein. But what do you all think? What is the main issue with the list, or do you think people are making a mountain out of a mole hill? I'd be interested in your thoughts, so comment down below. Catch you all in the next video.
Bang, bang.